All right. <clears throat> so we got through sentence tokenization, I believe, last time. Yes. So we ended here. And let's now jump into word tokenization and then finish out all the things that you have to do to process. So word tokenization is really one of the most important components to doing NLP work because nearly all of the things that we're going to do after this really require um, uh, thinking about text pieces at the word level. So sentence tokenization can be really useful for creating separate documents for, let's say, topics analysis or sentiment or whatever, but uh, word tokenization is pretty critical for park speech tagging, NER recognition, like all these things that we're going we're gonna to cover. And so it feels like this should be easy, like word tokenization should be easy, because it's just a simple white space, in English anyway, in most Latin-based languages. Um, however, there are some languages where there is no white space, right? So can I treat each character as a word? So if I think about um, uh, logographic or ideographic languages, right? Um, but sometimes individual characters mean multiple words, so how do I break that down? Um, but then we also have to not forget about contractions. So don't forget about contractions. So don't is actually two words. And we'll look at how to deal with contractions in a little bit. How do I deal with spelling errors and languages, like I said, that are logographic? So this is actually more complex than it seems, although on its basic level, uh, languages that use white spaces are a little easier to process. And so in R, this is in the tokenizers package, which we've already opened when we did sentence tokenization. Instead of tokenized sentences, it's tokenized words. It's not too hard. We've got our clean text that we've been working on cleaning up. Uh, I could lowercase that. Uh, we're going to talk about how to take out stop words in a different way because not every function includes this kind of stop words component. Sorry about that. Strip punctuation means take out punctuation. Strip numeric means take out numbers. I left that as false. And simplify equals false means to leave it in the list format. Okay, so for every piece it gets, it's going to return a list. In R. Um, so what we see is the um, text from my blog. I'm writing a very long bloggeroni piece right now about what I've been working on the last several days. So if you guys want to use that for your assignment, feel free. It's got tons of code in it, so you can look at it and think about how to do weird code removal um, or anything that with text without a lot of JavaScript. That's, I would tell you to avoid a website that's got a lot of Java on it. Don't use Google, because Google doesn't really have text on it. Um, my blog. Oh, it's linked here at the top. You just don't want to use this exact one. Where the heck is it? Okay. It's very boring. I don't post that often, but when I do, it's usually about code. Um, so my website's aggieerin.com. It's on the syllabus, too. Uh, I have like all my course materials and stuff. Um, up there, some shiny apps, some other stuff, boring stuff. But if you go to that, see, I spell it right. Spelling has been the bane of my existence today. All right, so this is the one I've been working on, how to install Form R. But you could do the English cartonic one and use this as the link. Okay. Um, it's kind of a fun question. My friend decided to ask me if words were skewed distributions. <laughs> And she just like sent me this text value text message that was like, if words are distributions, would they be cartonic? <laughs> so I tested that just for fun. Um, the answer is not really. Um, but that's where the, the blog post, this blog post comes from, is a different one that I wrote about Arvest. Right? So we can see it's like pretty much broken on white space. The real issues kind of come in when it's looking at uh, the code itself. So it dropped all the punctuation, all the commas, all the parentheses. It's kind of handy. Um, but then now we're left with code like position equals three, that kind of thing. So um, it does seem to work pretty well, though. And white space is the most common breaker. And punctuation. So notice here this HTTP thing got broken apart. 
There are some more functions in Python that do this, and I would say there's nothing wrong with the tokenizers package in R. It does work pretty well, but I would say that the like gold standard um, really comes from some um, tokenizers in NLTK. So the function is word tokenize. Okay. There's also a tree bank tokenizer, okay. the tuck talk tokenizer, and then a regular expressions tokenizer, which again, I would not use unless you have very specific criteria you're wanting to break words apart on. So I would start with the, the ones that are pre-programmed and then move to a regular expression one, because remember those are really hard to write. Okay. The other thing we can use is spacey, and we'll do both. So let's look at word tokenize. Okay, it's a special instance of the pen tree bank tokenizer. Um, sometimes this is called uh, punct, P U N K, P U N T K, I think is how it's spelled. And I jokingly like to call this a regular expression monster because what it is, is it's just, it's a set of rules to have break words apart on using spaces, punctuation, and some other kind of interesting regular expressions to handle abbreviations and acronym periods, like et cetera. Um, it focuses mostly on periods, separates commas and single quotes with a white space. Punctuation, if you allow it to stay in, is included as a separate token, so you don't lose the punctuation, you just break it apart. And it sort of deals with contractions because contractions have punctuation in them. Okay. Uh, function is pretty easy. NLTK, we've imported NLTK. Don't forget, you gotta load those libraries. So we did that last week. Dot word tokenize. Okay, I did this on my Python clean text. And then I told it to print words. So I end up with this a list. It's just a little bit bigger. Whoa, too much. There we go. Um, it's a list of tokens now. They were tokens. Now, spacey, on the other hand, um, is quite complex. It's a neural net model. It's been trained on lots of text with the answers. And so the, the way you use spacey, um, this is going to be really important. So put a big star here. We'll use this all semester. So you see it a bunch of times. But just kind of a reminder or kind of a, an explanation. First thing you do is import the library. Okay, this is true for all Python. You have to start by loading the library at R, right? Library, blah, blah, blah. Python's the same way. The function is import, though. So import spacey, load that library. Okay. Then we're going to build a model. Okay, so I want to run my natural language processing, and you'll see this in all of their examples. This is how they suggest you do it. By loading this spacey English language dictionary. They have a couple more. It's mostly European languages. Let's look real quick. So they have more than English. Most of our examples, unfortunately, are in English. Here we go. Oh, so they have, uh, oh, it says none yet. That's not very helpful now, is it? All right, here we go. So we've got German, Greek, English, Spanish, French, Italian, Lithuanian, Norwegian, Dutch, Portuguese. Like I said, mostly European languages. Uh, multi-language, and then they've got what looks like data for some other languages okay, that you might be able to use to train models. So thankfully, they have um, data sets for more than just English, but it doesn't look like they've totally built all of their language models out yet. Okay. But by the end of the semester, you'll have the skill set to do that yourself. All right, so back to this. So you load this model. It's essentially you're making this a function. I want to run an NLP function. So now I can just use that function, NLP on my clean text. Okay, when you do that and you've loaded Spacey's basic, or not basic, uh, default model, what you've gotten now is something that will do all of the chapters we're going to talk about. Okay, they have pre-trained this model to do word tokenization, part of speech tagging, NER tagging, dependency parsing, and more. So pretty much everything we're going to talk about this semester, Spacey is kind of a pre-built model for that. And so we're going to compare what Spacey does automatically with what we can build ourselves. 
So let's see what it did, gave me. Now, uh, the in this version, it printed very strangely. Um, after every comma here is the next piece. So this is part one, part two, part three, part four. So it kept a lot of the weird white space piece pieces, okay, where other ones um, get cut out. I'm sorry, is this sentences? Yes, I'm sorry. This is sentences. I was like, wow, this is looking terrible. All right, so this is spacey processed dot sense for sentences. And it says there are 118 sentences. I don't know if we remember last week, but the other two said that there were um, 33 and 39 or something like that. So this seems a little high for the sentence count. If I wanted to print the words, what I would do is I could loop over them. Okay, so I could say words dot text. So give me the text of each word for all of the words in my list. I told it to only print out the first 500. And this looks much better. So it kept, it keeps the white spaces, which uh, the other ones do not. So getting translations. So you're going to get a lot more sentences and a lot more words because it's going to hang, it does hang on to these extra um, end of line pieces and that kind of stuff. So we went from word tokenization in R, where we've basically turned off all of those features. To NLTK, which hangs on to some of the punctuation, but not all. It doesn't. It deletes the end of line stuff, and then Spacey, which just keeps everything. Okay, so we got a lot of a wide range of possibilities that we can use. Now, from here to the end, this is actually in an order that I would tell you to do. So when you're looking at the assignment, so I'm going to open this raw text example, which is linked online. When you're looking at the assignment, you want to match, okay, not important data here, uh, lowercase. Find the section in here that has lowercase. Uh, okay, it's well dot lower, right? So we do the lowercase section. All right, now find, take out symbols. Well, this section that we're about to cover is removing symbols. Okay, so match the, start with this example because this is basically the assignment okay. um, and it's got a uh, code in here kind of for you already to help you match and then the blank sections are the part where you're filling it in okay. and so the code isn't totally perfect because you'll see here rest of code goes here but it, this example is meant to help you get started on the homework all right so let's go back to removing symbols here so in this section, what you want to do for the homework is really use the, um, for the string here, you want to use your clean text. Okay. But I can't totally show you what it's doing if I just tell it to print all the clean text um, that we've been working on because that's a lot of text and you, when you won't see these weird symbols because I don't have them in, the co in, the, in my um, blog. Okay. But I want to show you what it's doing. So don't just totally cut and paste the slides, is what I'm telling you. Be sure you are editing it to match the assignment. All right. Now, sometimes things don't process correctly, and I've actually had this a, a, lot, a lot of problems with this lately because um, my super group project that I'm working on, that's a lot of fun. We have a lot of um, um, international scholars working with us, which is really cool, except that a lot of them have these sort of symbols in their name okay? or um, uh, so for interestingly the Chinese works fine it's these like extra accented symbols that like excel CSV it just does not like it eats them and this turns out garbage okay and so what I have to do is normalize that to the language that I'm processing in because when we upload uh, CSV files of the list of authors, otherwise it eats their name and it doesn't look right. Okay. So I was like, huh, I know this trick, I learned it in my class, right? So there's a function in R, um, icon, I guess is how you say that, I'm not sure, um, also works really well that I've used in different projects, but string i is a brilliant package that I love. Okay, string r I think is the one in tidyverse that we were talking about. It's actually built on string i, 
from what I was looking at earlier, or I've said that backwards, but one of them is built on the other, and they're both great. Okay, so string R we use for regular expressions. Okay, string I has some extra stuff in it. And one of the extra things that it does is this translate function. So this is essentially a set of regular expressions where it looks for accented characters, characters, weird symbols, right, and translates them into the target um, encoding scheme is what this is called. Okay. So I'm translating these characters into Latin ASCII, which would be what my computer normally handles, and you'll notice that it has just essentially gone, oh, okay, no accents. So this is an easy way to remove all of the symbols using R, a okay, string I. Now, in Python, there's this package called Unicode data. Okay. Unicode is a very popular encoding set because it'll, it translates all these characters into universal code, is the way I remember this, um, so that you can read it on any computer. Uh, UTF-8 here is a, um, a really common encoding set that like uh, databases use and people use for websites and that kind of thing so that you can see all the symbols. So we're going to define a little function here. So I've imported Unicode data and I've just made myself a function. I said remove accented characters. Okay, so the function is unicode.normalize. Um, leave this thing alone in FKD. So it's going to translate our text here from pretty much anything. It's going to encode it into ASCII, okay, ignoring symbols that are, are it can't read, and then decode that into UTF-8. So we're encoding and then decoding. And then it returns the text back to me so I don't have to type this whole thing about 600 times. So remove accent and characters here. I just passed it my R characters. So here I would put in my clean text if I wanted to do the entire text data that I was looking at earlier. And you can see it gave me the same answer okay, as my um, R package here. So string I is just a little bit simpler to run, like to type code-wise, but they work the same. All right. So this would normally be the first step I would take. I would remove all those symbols. Well, okay, first step actually I would take out all the HTML if I had data that included HTML. Second step I would do is remove all the symbols, like lowercase it and then remove all the symbols. Uh, no, on the assignment you'll see it asks you to do them in both languages. So like once we, we're going to do maybe a, another week or two and then we'll talk about the final project. The final project only has you do it in one. You get to pick your favorite language. Um, but for this assignment you have to do it in both languages. Where was I going with this? Remove HTML, lowercase everything, clean up the symbols, okay. replace contractions, and this is one of the areas that I have found an easy, easier function. Okay. And so what contractions are is they're shortened versions of several words, right? They're allowing us to merge words together. So technically, in theory, gonna is a contraction for going to. Um, uh, I was trying to think of my favorite, like, super long southern con contraction, but um, I just came up with might could have, which is something ridiculous that my better half and I talk about. What's the... Uh, could have, which is could have. I mean, there's some, like, really weird ones that are actually three different words, right? Um, so won't is will and not, right? And they really present us with some issues in processing text because... Um, I have to account for all these different combinations, and then depending on which tokenizing function you use, it will handle that apostrophe differently. So it's easier if you just deal with them first. Okay. They also will change the sentiment of a document because if you don't process won't as will not, it, it loses the not component. Howdy's not really a contraction though. Howdy is a very Texas thing. I went to Texas A&M, so I'm a big fan. Um, 
Because how do you just kind of one of those words? Contractions are definitely like two words, like squished together, like ain't is a good one. Um, although it technically doesn't have a, a full ex expression, it's probably will not. Ain't gonna, right? Um, <clears throat> but either way, these can cause us problems, especially the one, especially because it has the apostrophe. So how can we fix that? Well, the easiest way to deal with them is to have a lookup dictionary okay, where we have the contraction form and then it's expanded form. And then this just becomes a regular expression, um, a regular expression model okay, where I can go from um, contraction form to full form. I guess it's am not. So ain't is a weird one because other than its cultural representation in the South, right, it's it's mostly contractions. Uh, the apostrophe is where the um, word gets squished, so to speak. So won't here is also a strange one, but don't, right, is the, the apostrophe is replacing the O and do not, right? Y'all, it's you all, so the apostrophe is replacing, replacing the U, O, and U. So ain't kind of a weird one because it doesn't technically expand in a way that you would expect. Um, so that is a whole another lecture <laughs> though. Uh, we already have these kind of lookups. Now this contraction thing would also be very handy for acronyms if you decided to spell out text speech like LOL. Um, so you can make your own. So let's look at the options in R here first. So um, one thing that I always recommend people do, especially if you're on a Mac, uh, is dealing with the quote issue. Okay. And this sometimes is a Windows issue problem. I, th I feel like I have more issues with it on my Mac when I've been working on something that someone else has had in Windows. I don't know which computer it is. It's the problem, really. Um, and I've been looking at Unix all day. So... <laughs> I, I vote that we all switch back to Unix. Not really. So I love my Mac. Um, where am I going with this? The quote thing. So I don't know if you can see this here, but this is like the quote is like either curly. I can see this in, in um, Word where it does that like curly quote where the quote has the little extra ball on the end or it's um, accented sideways. So it's actually like um, the thing above the tab on a QWERTY keyboard. Okay. Uh, so that kind of quote can give you problems and what you want are the quotes that are just like straight up and down okay. and and sometimes um the functions we're using can handle either one and sometimes they can't they can't so i always just replace it completely first okay. especially in r there's something about it in r but <clears throat> what i could do here and i actually don't need to do this unlist function i'm pretty sure that uh, we could do this in a simpler way. So let's just test this theory. Remove accented carry. Okay, we've done this. Oh wait, that's the assignment. I was like, where did this, where did my notes go? Unlist, there we go. So I'm not even sure we need to do this so much. Right, what we could just do. <clears throat> is put in our plain text. Okay. So the way that string replace all works, remember, is that you put in some form of a text and then you tell it what pattern you have and how you want to replace it. Okay. So let's try that, see if that runs. Seems to have run fine. Uh, let's see here, let's look at clean text now. And it's just one giant string, but that's okay. Um, and let's see what we should have seen if I look at my um, ex like where in that example it would have been. Now it's really messy um, because, but it didn't replace here's, so maybe that didn't work. But what we can do? Oh, I'm sorry, that just replaced the cop the Quotes. I haven't even run this function yet. Derp. Okay. What we would do to replace the contractions okay, is put in our clean text 
tell it we want this particular contraction key lexicon. So you can run this to view what all the options are. So let's see if ain't is in here. Cause, twas, ain't, am not. Okay, you're right. Um, so, but that doesn't make sense if, say, he ain't going to do that. Because that would be he will not do that. But I guess am and will. Anyways, I could get off on a tangent here. But these are all the ones it's going to replace. You could add things to that. Okay. So then what we do is we would just run, oops, the whole chunk. <laughs> So that I loaded the library text clean here. And it should replace the here's and all that kind of stuff in here for us automatically. Now, <clears throat> we got a lot of other problems because it didn't um, clean out all of the slash ends earlier. But let's see. Here is kind of stuck. But I think my other ones did, like will and won't, that kind of thing. Now let's see if the here's issue is because it's not in our lexicon. So these are in alphabetic order. That's helpful. Yeah. So that's why that didn't expand. It's because it doesn't have the here is as part of that. So I'd want to. I could add that to my contractions list and expand here's if I wanted to. <clears throat> So that's a simpler way to do that one. Okay, you don't have to tokenize it first. I thought you did, but you don't. So great, that makes it easier. So let's look at the uh, option in Python, which also has a much easier way to do this. Okay. Which I didn't figure out until like much later. Um, what you can do, you load the contractions library. So we don't even need that. We just import the contractions library. And then you do contractions. Okay. I'm going to leave this option in here. Contractions. Okay. <clears throat> but this is the easier option. All right, let's see what happens when we're not. So the cool thing is that, you know, I was reading the textbook and it like goes through this horribly long, complicated like formula to run this contraction stuff. And then I figured out this shorter version of this earlier. And then <laughs> I was like, I wonder, um, wonder what the help guide says. And there's a function called dot fix. Wow, so easy. So let's see if it fixed the here's on there. So not here, as I didn't grab that, but I do know it works. Right, so let me prove to you that this works. Um, so we've got contractions dot fix. So here it doesn't work, but won't does. Mm -hmm. And so this is so much faster and easier. It's one quick little line. All right. Now this one's a little harder. So we often have to deal with things that are incorrect. So maybe you have slang, okay, where people type like they're talking. Okay. Um, we have spelling errors, where we just misspelled the word. We could have issues of, do I choose to stem the words or do I choose to limitize the words? Okay. And we'll talk more about what each one of those is in a minute. Okay. And then we also, um, after when I'm talking about correcting text, we've also already talked about now contractions and um, symbols. Okay. So now we've kind of moved on to issues with the user. <laughs> and not issues with just the text formatting. Okay. So let's see, what can I do? Well, here's an example of the word finally, where somebody spelled it like they were talking and drawing it out, right? Like, finally. Right. Okay. Here's a great thing. String replace all that we've been using in string R. The pattern here 
is, is the special regular expression where there's alphas, an alphanumeric code, like this is uh, any letter, um, that's represented one plus times, one or like, um, one, yeah, one or more times. So it's going to find the F, the I, the N, A, and L, and Y. And uh, remember our plus, back up here in regular expressions, is one or more cases. And so, but we don't know exactly which letter we want. So I can't say A plus, B plus, D plus, because then it would look for exact matches there. It's over here. And so the cool thing is this uh, kind of one number. So any alphanumeric code one or more times, okay, replace it with that particular one. Okay, so this slash slash one is a special character. That's like any one of these one or more times. And so it essentially runs along and finds each letter. And if it's doubled up, it replaces it with one. Okay. Now, the problem with that with the word finally is it actually should have two L's. Okay. And there are many words in, the, um, in any language that have multiple things together, like double L's. Okay. And so if you do this, which is kind of a hack, right? It's kind of a quick and dirty way to get rid of a lot of these extra characters um, or double O's or double E's. I definitely recommend spell checking next, okay, to fix it back. So a spell checker would say, oh, that's just finally misspelled. Okay. Or I would tell it to ignore anything that's two L's together, two O's together, two E's together, um, because in English those are pretty common. Okay. I would not tell it to ignore two A's. Now it's more common in Swiss, German? I forget. Different language, <laughs> right? But I wouldn't, in English, maybe tell it to ignore the most common ones. Okay. So like if it's a double, if it's two, exactly two S's, leave it alone, right? If it's exactly two L's, leave it alone. Okay. Um, so this is kind of a, um, a, a sledgehammer to this problem, if you will, for a bad euphemism, where we're just like correcting every possible double letter, but then we might spell check it to fix it back. In Python, it's a sim, it's the exact same kind of function idea. It just is written fairly differently. So this is any alphanumeric character in Python's version versus um, uh, the R tidyverse version. And that's the same special character, slash one. Replace it with just one of those, and we get the same answer. So remember that regular expressions, each um, different version is got its own flavor, so to speak. So that's one reason why it's so hard to learn is because these are not the same across the languages because you have to write it in a way that that language reads it. Okay. So it has to be double slashes here and a single slash here. All right, spelling. Spelling is kind of the most giant pain in existence. Um, I try to avoid it if at all possible because it's tedious, it can run, take a really long time to run, and it requires a lot of extra intervention, if you will. Um, so I have a project that I'm actually ignoring completely right now because I have, still have to go through about 12,000 spelling errors. But if you don't feel like checking it, you can run this kind of function that'll be pretty good. Now I, this is a little bit long, and I think it's mostly um, because this, the kind of longer version here, allows us to save a spelling dictionary of things that we've already fixed. So once I've gone through them once, if you have a, a known spelling data set, if you will, you can just keep adding exceptions to it rather than doing it over and over again. Uh, so there's probably a bit faster way to do this, but the good news about it is that you can, out, you can save it out. Okay, so what I have um, that I'm ignoring is I've run all this stuff, saved my spelling dictionary, I've opened it in Excel, and I've just been going through it one at a time, making sure it's right, because it's not always right. It does choose the wrong answer sometimes, because spell checkers aren't perfect. They're just guesses based on um, usually Levenstein distance, like how, how many letters I have to change right, before it becomes the, the new correct word. Um, 
And so I, I've ended up with this dictionary of like, here's a misspelling, here's our best guess for what it is. Because Hunspell here actually will give you multiple guesses on which one's right. All right, so let me show you, and I can show you how, um, how it doesn't always get it right too. So here's our example of misspelled words. Okay, so these words are misspelled, that's what I was going for here. The first thing that you do is you run the Hunspell function on your list of words, and I'm fairly sure for Hunspell you don't have to tokenize. That's why. Yeah, so you don't have to tokenize it first. You can um, just uh, run it on the entire like raw text. And so I'm actually gonna do fix this too, since we just gave you a simpler solution. Okay. So I'm gonna update that. <clears throat> Um, and so I've got it kind of started here as an example, but don't forget there's going to be more here. All right, so back to our back to our real examples here. So you run Hunspell on the entire text, okay. and then once you have those errors, what it looks like, and so I want to show you how this looks because this is why it's kind of slow to do. Um, let's run this one. But let's just try this on our full clean text, right? So we're going to say spelling errors equals hun spell clean text. Okay. So that's going to take a second to run. So what you get back from that is a list. And so that's why you unlist it. It's because it gives you a list, which is annoying. So let's look at what's in that list, though. And so here are all the words it thinks are misspelled. Now, these repeat clearly because our vest is in here a bunch of times. So we could do unlist and um, unlist, and I'm sorry, unique. So we can add that unique function here. So what does that do? Well, the nice thing about unique is that once I unlist this and do unique, it'll run a little bit faster because it's a, it's taken out all of the doubles. Well, I thought it would. Oh, sorry. It's the other way around. <laughs> it takes out all the doubles. Clearly it does not. Oops. This way. You have to unlist and then unique. This is why I don't like live coding. One, I can't spell. Two, I forget order matters. All right, so it took out all of the different forms of our best. So this way you're only checking the dictionary once for each spelling error and not checking the same spelling error over and over again. Okay, that runs a little bit faster. All right, so the Hunspell suggest function takes these errors and figures out what its best guess is. And we're using an English American dictionary because there's actually a British version in here too. So let's see what happens when we run that. So it also took the list, but for this first one, it suggested for our vest, it suggests rest, I guess, or vest, or our space vest, or very strangely, start. <laughs> for website, it suggests website two words, breadcrumb is one word. Um, and it does suggest words be capitalized to, um, but that's okay. We can re-lowercase it if you want. So we've got all these spelling suggestions. Now what I'm going to do is take, this is the hack, okay? This is the quick and dirty hack where you take just the first suggestion. So these are in order of probability, which one is the most likely. And this line of code right here will grab the very first suggestion from all of them. Yes, so the reason it suggests star, most spell checkers work on this idea of um, what's called, usually, don't quote me on this, Levenstein distance, 
which is how many letters or sometimes uh, optical string alignment, OSA? I don't remember the exact acronym here, but this idea of like how many substitutions do I have to make from word one to make it word two? So from arvest to rest, that is one deletion. And then arvest to vest is also one deletion. So that's why it came up with these two as the most popular. And rest is a more probable word in the English language than vest. So that's why it came up. Okay. Uh, so you're right. It's coming up with star because it's very, it's a similar set of letters, but the it's a lot of changes because right? you have to reorder the letters and then add some. So I do find it odd that um, it's not so far away. Right? Like there is a limit to how many changes it says that are okay before you um, don't suggest it. That's what I was trying to say. Uh, this is the hack where it grabs only the first one. So now I have a vector of the correct answer, give or take. I'm going to make that into a spelling dictionary. So I'm going to put the error together with the diction with the suggestion. Okay. Oops. And that went bonkers. Oh, because I have spelling errors, I, I'm sorry, are, um, are multi, uh, duplicated. So I got to use unique here as well. I change it in both places. Okay, now I just, I think I've made it mad. Are they not the same links? Wait, did unique not work? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, unique. Did I misspell unique? Why is it not double do? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. So we have to do the same thing we did up here. My brain is so fried, you guys. It is Thursday, although all the days are running together. Let's try this one more time. I told my husband earlier that we couldn't order um, B-Dub's Thursday special because it was Wednesday. <laughs> and then he was like, no, it's not. It's, it's, oh, yeah, you're right. So here now, what we have on Thursday is the um, list, uh, or, uh, brrr, this is a data frame of incorrect answer to correct answer, assuming the first answer is the best answer. Okay, so now that I've got my code looking correctly here, um, what does that do for me? Well, when I have a spelling dictionary, I can now do that exact same thing as what I did with contractions. But I have to be careful because sometimes words are smaller components of other words. And so I don't want it to replace the entire, like, in the middle of a word. So let's say you had um, T-I-O-N just hanging out there because of some other spelling issue. And if you told to replace T-I-O-N um, across your text, it would fix all of the, like, words like action. It would replace in inside that word. So what we're doing here in this line of code is creating a regular expression pattern, the R version, that says um, only change the whole the word when it's the whole word. Okay. Well, why didn't that work? Spelling dicks, spelling errors. Okay. This is what I get for trying to make code the code easier, right? So look, I just made it more complicated. All right, so now it has the correct thing in here. There we go. There we go. So the point I'm trying to make here is um, what we've said is look for our vest, but specifically make sure there's a word boundary. Okay, so the slash B here stands for word boundary in regular expressions. 
which means it won't find the word harvest, like what harvest is supposed to stand for, and only replace the last like four letters. Okay, this makes sure that it finds that entire string as a word to replace with. Now here's the biggest issue um, with this hack is um, many of these, like, well, these are specific words that I really wouldn't want to replace because the website is about the Arvest package. Okay. Some of these are fine, but JPG to jog is definitely not what I want. Um, <laughs> Dplyr got changed to Dimply, which I find kind of funny. So these don't always work well. Okay? If you have a lot of specialized text like we do in this blog, spelling is not a good idea. Um, so spell checking, you got to take it with a grain of salt basically, but this is the sort of quick-ish way to output a dictionary that you could then save, edit yourself, and import back in. Because as long as you import it with this set of names, you can use this function. Okay. So we can use clean text, or clean text R, say here are the, all of the spelling patterns defined, here's all the spelling suggestions, replace them all. Okay. Now that I fixed that, real super duper -y quick, I'm going to fix this one in our example too, so that they both match. All right. So spelling in Python is so much easier, <laughs> but that's because it only gives you one word as a possible solution. Okay, it picks the most common one for you. So these two um, give you the same answer basically. Um, but again, be careful because if this is for the word these, and it suggested the word the, and um, that would be incorrect. Now in Python, the function is word, like capital word. And so what you would do is do word on your um, individual words. I do think this has to be tokenized. So let's check out here. So create your tokenized word list, and then they have to, you have to use fix them. So this one does require a tokenized list, unlike the R one that'll let you do that big long string. And so we do word for each word, give me the correction for everything in our list. Okay. So it looks kind of crazy because I use the word word here to indicate token, but the capital word is the function. So for each individual token, give me the correct answer back in my full list. And what we see here is that it also corrected these to the, and now misspelled into this spelled, which I think is funny. Okay. So they will give you slightly different answers because they're different algorithms underneath. All right. Let's look at stemming and limitization now. Okay, spell checking is this, the hard part. So stimming is taking off the morphemes. Okay. Uh, you might think of these as affixes. Okay, so morphemes have the smallest unit of meaning. Okay. And so stimming is a regular expression procedure. So notice how often regular expressions come up in our functions. So many of the functions that we're going to use are fancy regular expressions. Okay. Or thankfully someone else has written for us. So stimming is a regular expression procedure where you just simply cut off the stem, the inflection, the affix of the word. Okay. So jumping, jumps, jumped, all become jump because you remove the ing, the s, and the ed. But that's true for mourning as well. It becomes mourn, which is not a real word. Okay. So things like wings become the w because the s and the ing are removed. So stimming is also a very hacky procedure um, because words turn into sometimes nonsense. Um, compare that, however, to limitization, which is where you take the word and put it back into its root. So wings becomes wing because that's its root word. And this requires a dictionary lookup where we have the original root, root word. Um, that's a little bit harder. There are some functions that'll do limitization pretty well um, in R and Python. Um, 
that I didn't learn about, of course, until I had already um, done a lot of this by hand myself. So live and learn. Okay. Um, but let's look at those. Okay. Now it does require that you have the part of speech for the limitization function because um, words are ambiguous often in their meaning and so sometimes um, sometimes the part of speech helps deambiguify that, deambiguify, make clear which one it should correct to. So we recognize wings as a noun, which means you can remove the S for the plural, but don't remove the ing because it's not a verb. Uh, comes in handy with plural words, yes. Uh, stimming is fast. It's fast and dirty, and it works pretty well if um, your goal is not... Mm, it depends on the goal. Like for a topics kind of model, you can stim pretty easily. It helps reduce the dimensionality of the data, meaning there aren't as many words. And as long as you can remember how your stimmer works, you can still read it. Um, stimming for some cases is too much of a hack where you can't understand the output that you're getting. Or it combines things that it shouldn't. Um, but let's look at stimming first, because it's definitely easier. So the TM library, which is a very popular text text library in R, does a lot of things, will stim for you. The function can be stim document. Okay. Now this one actually just removed the S from wings. Jumped, but morning it hacked up and reading it hacked. Um, well, reading to read is correct. Uh, I have seen some of the stimmers that will remove both. Okay. I have that example in there because of the project I had been working on. All right, in Python, okay, the there's two options, the Porter stimmer and the Lancaster stimmer. If you ever see Snowball stimmer, that is the Porter, the newer form of the Porter stimmer, and the the version that TM uses is the Snowball stimmer. But uh, what I can do is in NLTK, this one, it's a little weird how you have to add, do this first. So you import the function and then you save it as something else. <laughs> so you say, hey, Porter Stimmer becomes PS because it's too much to write. You have to kind of like activate it, turn on a blank model. Um, LS for Lancaster Stimmer. I think it just loop over each word. So on these, you do have to have um, tokenized words first. So give me the porter stem for each word, okay, wing jump, more in red, and the Lancaster stem for each word, wing jump, more in red. So for this particular set of words, they're not different, um, but they do have some pretty, pretty subtle differences. So if you run them on a whole lot of text, you'll see some differences between porter and Lancaster. Now, limitization, thankfully, this really cool text stem is such a cool package. Um, will allow you to do this in a fairly decent way um, that runs so much faster <laughs> than the way that I originally um, suggested to people to do this. But there are uh, other ways to use um, tree bank tokenizers or tree bank limitizers that are a bit more accurate. So this text stem function, as far as I can tell, works pretty well for common words, but is not quite as accurate for a large weird data set. Um, I haven't um, calculated the accuracy exactly, but the uh, the there are other ways to do this using this corpus k package um, that are more complex to set up. That's not worth really teaching people until you've got, like you know knee deep into limitization and you need a better algorithm. Then we can talk. But for simple ways to do this to get started. The text stem package has a really great function. Uh, tree tagger, that's the word I was looking for. Um, the best way to do this that I've found so far is a part of speech mapper that uses the pen tree bank to tag the words and then looks them up in the tree tagger dictionary. And we could probably get by with these simpler functions. So load text stem, okay, and the function is limitize words, and then you get. Um, your list of words back and it looks pretty good. You can also limitize the entire string, which is really useful if your clean text is one huge long string. 
And so check out, my system keeps crashing. His crashed yesterday, ours crashes daily. So we got my system keep crash, his crash yesterday, ours crash daily. So it works pretty well because ours, however, probably should be, um, that's uh, possessive. It's not really, is that plural or is it possessive? Ours crashes daily. Hmm. Kind of a weird mix, but so there was a question if we should get rid of this S or not. Right. <clears throat> and make it back to R. All right. Now in Python, there is, uh, the, the best way to work this is with Spacey, and Spacey's really good. Like, I wish I had known better. <laughs> Um, with my code that I had presented on, like, here's how to limitize this, this tree tagger thing, and it's really complicated. And then I get over and I'm like, oh, Spacey's really great. Should just teach people Python instead. Um, so Spacey will do this for you. And so we can write a little function that makes this a touch easier since you have getting things out of Spacey is the hard part. Not making Spacey do it is just one simple little function, but getting it back out is the hard part. So let's say, okay, run NLP on our text that we input, and then join together, and this is the whole big thing here, the lemma of the word, if the word lemma is not pronoun, okay, which is what that stands for, else just give me the text back. So give me, give me the lemma, unless it's a pronoun, then just give me the text back. And then it'll get the same answer as we did a minute ago. Now, because Spacey was involved, you will notice that you get these spaces because it broke down each um, punctuation piece as a separate um, word token. Okay. R, is that which belongs to us without a following noun? Wait, let me see. <laughs> Oh, so ours is the lemma. Adjective. Oh, fascinating. So I have that wrong. Ours is the root word because usually root words are often the adjective, the blah, 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 the noun form. Often, not always. And so that being R being the adjective would um, make it the not root word. <laughs> Fascinating. Okay, thank you. I learned a thing today. And that is why you should always look these things up. Okay, this these systems too are not perfect. That's actually correct. I was wrong, but still limitization systems are as good as the dictionary underlying them. Uh, so they don't often catch slang. Not that the word R is a slang, but you guys get the idea. So the last piece here, let's talk about stop words. Okay. Stop words are function words like um, the and a of but into on and on and on okay so when I say function words I mean these are the words that hold up the sentence they're the glue for the sentence they help you or any speech really um, keep the sentence in a grammatically correct way but don't provide a lot to the meaning words of a sentence. So nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, pronouns are the, the semantic context of a sentence. Okay. Now the and, a, and of do definitely add to meaning, but generally are considered function words. So if I say the dog, right, um, so I'm talking about my better half and I'm like, I believe what the dog did today. He knows that I mean our dog, who's actually being very good right now. Um, but if I say, you won't believe what a dog did today, he would look at me like, whose dog? Okay, so there are those um, subtle differences when we use specific types of determinants is what those are called. Um, but in general, most people think that fun those function words don't necessarily add a whole lot to um, measures of meaning. Okay? So the ultimate goal at the end of the semester is to talk about sentiment analysis. When we talk about sentiment, we're talking about meaning. The D does not really add a whole whole lot to the understanding of negativity and positivity, right? So they're often removed from a text. Um, this also um, reduces the dimensionality of the text, meaning there are less words, because you won't believe how many times we use these words in uh, text. I think the and a are the most common words in the English language. Of is like in the top five. Okay. Um, 
So generally, a lot of times we'll talk about removing them for complex analyses. We won't when we're doing part of speech tagging, because that's the point. But um, so nouns and verbs can pray, portray the meaning in a sentence. And we usually want to remove them. Uh, not always, but usually. And literally, there are probably 35 ways to do this in R. <laughs> there are so many ways. Um, my favorite is with TM, though, because I just really like the TM package. It's just brilliant, brilliant package. And so I just wanted to kind of show you here. The um, TM library here does need to be loaded for this function to work. There is a stop words package that gets installed, and it has a list of all these different types of stop words. Um, the smart list is, I think, kind of long. Here, let's see. Stop words. Let's see. Uh, see here what do we got so in the stop words function you can use language equals en source equals snowball and there's a bunch of different examples of codes in different languages that you can use um like dutch uh, no, i'm sorry that's german i think words um let's see yes uh and they can get kind of long so let's see how long the english one is Hundred and seventy five words. Well this smart version, which I think is in TM, that specific smart type. Okay. And so unused argument. So I forget how I get this to load. Is it because TM's loaded? I think so. Which maybe it isn't because we have the co way we're running um the code here yeah so this is in not in the stop words package but in the tm package they have the same function which is a little annoying right so that's like 500 long and it actually also removes contractions so um one thing i'm gonna do to make this much more obvious is tell you that this is the tm stop words function okay. for future notice uh, so that if you're running this and you have the stop words package open, you know which one you're getting. Okay. So it's really, really long. It has a bunch of examples. Okay. So I don't, this includes a lot of adverbs. There are some in here that I wouldn't have removed, but it does remove lots of different types of words. You can also use um, uh, kind equals en for English. And you, know, you get approximately the same list as the stop words package. Okay. All right, so how do I do that? Well, because uh, I was just showing you there where and what they were, what you do is you do remove words, okay, with the capital W. You put in your sentence you're interested in and you tell it what kind of stop words you want to remove. And so you'll see here that it removed pretty much all the pronouns and some of the simple verbs and keeps. Um, in Python, what you essentially can do is this kind of complex, it's a, a loop in a loop that basically removes stop words. So the stop words that everybody uses are the list from NLTK. And then just look at them. Let's see here, we've got some of our contractions. If you haven't fixed them, below, but, so it's pretty long. And unfortunately, you have to do this on a tokenized list. So what you do is give me the words back for each word in my tokenized sentence. So this loops over and breaks it apart into one token at a time. So give me all the words back if that word is not in our stop word list. So what it does is it loops over the sentence and takes one word at a time, compares it to the stop word list, and gives it back to you if you don't, if it's not in the list. And so what we end up with is this. My system keeps, so this one kept the word keeps, crashing, crashed yesterday, crashes daily. Uh, and you do keep the punctuation here. Unlike the R one that, uh, well, it left it in because it did a regular expression replace. 
So this R function didn't require that we have um, the regular expression replacer, so it just like took them out, right? The Python version requires that we break it down into tokens first. Or there's a way to do this for regular expressions, but it's a, it's honestly more complicated than this double loop here. All right, so let's bring this all together and then look at the assignment. So there is no correct normalization procedure. I remember this whole shebang is called normalization. It really depends on the goals of the analysis. There are plenty of times where I completely skip spelling. Um, there are plenty of times where I will skip, because it's Twitter data and that's just not worth spell checking, there's times where I will skip um, doing lemmatization or stemming because they're not worth the trouble. Right? So it really just depends. And you'll see this across the semester when we do cleaning of text. We'll talk about this one's useful now, this one's not useful. Uh, I recommend on each step, and you'll see this on the assignment, is to print out a small piece. Don't print the whole thing because then the report becomes way too unwieldy to read. But I recommend printing a small piece of your text and just seeing, like, does this look right? Does it look like I've removed everything I need to? Um, and then we'll, we'll update these procedures as we go. And so we'll use these all semester, this set of rules to allow us to process and clean up our text because otherwise garbage in, garbage out. And so in summary, everything, what did we do? What did we learn? We talked about how text is super messy. So we always will have to be working on cleaning text. That is a main theme for the semester. We talked at the beginning of the last lecture about slicing and calling variables. So lists versus vectors versus, we mostly just did lists. Uh, we looked at tokenization, word and sentence, thought about Regular expressions is kind of the workhorse for a lot of our processes. Removing symbols, dealing with contractions, dealing with spelling errors, and long spelled out words. Uh, stimming or limitization, and then stop words finally.